Hello, I'm John Neff, Global Editor-in-Chief of Motor One, and welcome to this week's episode of the Motor One Podcast. The Frankfurt Motor Show happened this past week, and among all the new cars that were shown was one we just couldn't stop staring at. It's the BMW Concept 4, which is a two-door concept car that foreshadows what the redesigned 4 Series Coupe will look like. Now, we weren't staring at it because it was so good looking. We stared because of its grill, which is a comically large version of BMW's iconic twin kidney grill. This whole giant grill trend has finally jumped the shark, and we've got BMW to thank for it. On today's episode, we're discussing BMW's new epic nose, as well as the best BMWs of all time, and our favorite grills of all time. Joining me is MotorOne.com senior editor, Jeff Perez. How are you doing, Jeff? Good, John. How are you? Good, thanks. And filling the other chair is writer Chris Bruce. How are you, Chris? Doing great. Always glad to be here. Awesome. So um, there were lots of debuts at the Frankfurt Motor Show this past past week, um, including the Land Rover Defender, which was a huge one. Uh, But this concept car uh, caught all of our eyes uh, in in not a good way. Uh, This this kidney grill on the BMW Concept 4, like I said, is comically large. It goes from the leading tip of the hood pretty much all the way down the front of the vehicle. So it's it's uh, it's a vertical grill, which is kind of unlike um, the, the last few generations of BMW grills that have kind of been more horizontal kidneys uh, that stretched across the grill. Um, first of all, let me start by asking each of you, uh, what do you think of this concept overall and what do you think of the grill itself? So, uh, Chris, why don't we start with you? Sure. Um, it's hideous, or at least the gr- I should say the grill is hideous. It's too big. It took what the X7 started and was already bad and just makes it worse. And I think the rest of it kind of just looks like the existing 4 Series. So, uh, it's to me, it's kind of lackluster. I you know it the, the color's pretty i really like the kind of ruby Ooh, red on it but that's the, that's always the worst backhanded compliment for a concept car or a new car at an auto show <laughs> the color's good <laughs> but otherwise this is this doesn't do anything for me jeff yeah, how about, what are you how at? about you jeff yeah it's bad i mean i just I, you look at this and you're like what were they thinking right because i've defended the 7 series and the x7 for their big stupid grills because i kind of like the gaudiness of it but this just this just looks bad and the rest of the design isn't even super imaginative if you like kind of block off the face and look at just the rest of it it looks almost like a q60 which is not a good uh not a good thing to say about a bmw concept yeah i i agree i think as offensive as as the front grill is the kind of uh it, it's almost just as offensive for the rest of the car to drop the ball and be so uh anonymous kind of just just so generically coupe style you know um you know you brought up uh chris you brought up the x7 and the, and jeff you brought up the 7 series that's a great point i'd actually forgot that bmw had already taken a step or two down this path with those two vehicles i think the difference is though uh, the seven series and the X seven, they're like the top of the line. They're like the, the best sedan you can get and the best, uh, SUV you can get from BMW. So like, I expect their level of ostentatiousness to be a little bit more off the charts than the rest of the lineup. Uh, but clearly they were just preludes and they're going to spread this, uh, giant grill to every vehicle in the BMW lineup. And man, what do you think it's like being either a designer or a product manager or an executive at BMW when not only when you get this feedback after you make the debut, but they had to know it was coming. They had to know like, this is not going to go over well. Or do you think they were just completely, totally not self-aware? What do you, what do you think, Chris? Um, so two things, piggyback, piggybacking on something you said a second ago about the X7 and the 7 series. I don't like the grill there, but those are both larger vehicles. So their proportions kind of make it work better. Whereas here, it's such a relatively compact vehicle that it makes the grill look even bigger than it probably is. Like if you had a, a tape measure, I bet it's not that much bigger than the X7, but it's on such a smaller vehicle that it looks that way. What is this going to look like on the two series? <laughs> like it's going to be, no, it's going to go up the hood like two feet. But to get to your question, so 
that's kind of a question we've discussed amongst ourselves. There's some rumors that this design is pushed by especially the Chinese market where apparently bigger grills are more popular, but I also have seen no proof that that's the case of you know anyone who's actually talked to someone and said, yeah, that's true. So until I hear that, I'm not necessarily well, convinced. That's a that's an interesting theory because the Chinese keep in mind that's not my theory. It's just what I've heard, and I don't even know that I necessarily agree with it. Well, but there there is precedent for that because the Chinese market has been strong enough to demand its own versions of cars for a long time. Almost every automaker that sells in China has a long wheelbase version of their cars uh, because the the Chinese market demands a longer wheelbase with just just a crazy amount of rear legroom. Um, so automakers have made that concession and make special versions of their cars for that market. Um, to see a market, though, dictate um, an aesthetic like this, that, again, if I were at BMW, I would have raised my hand at the design roundtable meeting and said, hey, I know the Chinese might like this, but this is not going to go over well in North America or Europe or anywhere else outside of China. So how about we make two different cars or, you know, we just go back to the drawing board. Like, uh, so, so that's where the theory I think breaks down a little bit. Yeah. I was reading an interview with, um, Van Hoydunk. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, but the, uh, the BMW design boss and your point about China is, is right to an extent, Chris. And he even admits so in this interview with Forbes. Oh, I haven't um, seen that. Okay. I'll have to look at that. But he also lumps in the USA with that, with with the Chinese market. So it's not just China. He's also saying that the US and the Middle East and China all want these big gaudy grills, well, which I don't know if that's totally true. I, I think if he's looking around at his competitors, he would believe that's true. You look at Audi, you look at Lexus, and their grills have gotten to the point where they've basically eaten up the entire front end of those cars. So I can see where he gets that impression. But I also feel like as as journalists we have written about and criticized how large grills have gotten for some time now. So I don't know. It could be a case where where the the buying public disagrees with us and those giant grills are being received well and they're getting good feedback. But, you know, I... Uh, I, I feel like we have, uh, at least from a from the journalist perspective, we've done our part to criticize the design trend as being okay. You know, it, it's gone on long enough, and and we've had our fun. Let's scale it back down. You know, um, the other uh, two other things I wanted to bring up. One is that, uh, and I need to look at the front end of this. When you get grills this large, it usually means a very small proportion of that grill, a very small percentage of that grill actually lets air through. Like there's no way a hundred percent of this giant grill functionally lets air through. So I'm imagining uh, much like other grills uh, that are this big, it's kind of like the faux exhaust out back where you've got, you know, these, you know, beautiful exhaust tips that don't connect to anything because the, the exhaust, you know, empties before them or, or, or routes down. Um, you know, a lot of this, uh, a lot of car design these days has become so aesthetic. That's uh, so so much uh, driven by the aesthetic that's uncoupled from the function. That to me, that's kind of sad because it, it it breaks down as soon as you look a little closer, as soon as you look behind that exhaust tip or at that grill closely, you or or at that vent that you know doesn't vent anything. Um, you know, everything breaks down, and I just think that that's kind of um, I don't know, it, it, maybe this sounds wishy-washy, but it kind of breaks the trust with the the viewer of the car that that you what you're presenting them is the real deal, right? Um, you know, I like cars that where everything that's on it is there for a purpose and d- performs a function. So it's funny that you mentioned that. I was looking at our live photos and I just put it in our chat here. You guys can see it too. We got a very, very good front end photo of the concept and you can see that it is almost entirely all blocked off except for a very small portion at the bottom. So your your thoughts were exactly right, John. It's mostly just there for looks. Yeah, yeah. That's and that's such a dumb... And that's not just BMW. I mean, I was driving the Avalon uh, last week, which also has a big, terrible grill, and ninety percent of it is blocked off. I think there's only a small, like, sliver just under the hood that is actually open and lets air in. And even on the TRD one, which is the one we drove last week, 
uh, it's supposed to be, you know, quote unquote performance model. I asked, I said, why didn't you open up the grill? You could let more airflow in, you could put a turbo in here, you could do something. And they said, oh, well, it, you know, it would, it would be more detrimental to the aerodynamics than it would beneficial to airflow. So that was like, okay, so why would you even Right. So then why carve out the grill if you're just going to block it off? I imagine having a smaller grill with more sheet metal would be more aerodynamic than just having a large unfunctioning grill, which, yeah, the Avalon, uh, it's uh, the Avalon is one of the worst. Uh, uh, So great to bring that up as well as an example. Uh, Let me read you a quote from the press release for the concept for where BMW PR tries to talk about this grill. So I'm going to read this word for word. They say, grabbing the attention at the heart of the front end is the vertical kidney grill. The kidney grill has always been a signature feature of BMW cars, reflects uh, Damagage Dukech, head of BMW design. The BMW Concept 4 presents a confident and classy take on this iconic feature. At the same time, the BMW Concept 4 offers a look ahead to the expressive face of the 4 Series range. The vertically oriented grille fits seamlessly into both the proportions of the front end and BMW's illustrious past. Indeed, its form and design reference legendary classics such as the BMW 328 or the BMW 3.0 CSI and therefore shine the spotlight on the BMW brand's long and successful history as a maker of fine coupes. Um, so that's how, that's called spin. That is how I think a BMW PR person uh, just tries to, mention this and get past it in the press release as quickly as possible. It does mention some um, historical BMWs, the 328 and the 3.0 CSI. And that that leads me on to my next uh, topic, which is BMW design throughout history. Because some of my least favorite BMWs, and I could be in the minority here, are, I think it's the, the 70s and 80s where they had the really thin, really vertical twin kidney grill. It wasn't as big as, as the monstrosity on, the, on, the, on this Concept 4, but that was just the general proportions of them. They're really skinny and really tall. To me, that was the, the, the worst looking version of the twin kidney grill. Um, but there have been a lot of, I think, good versions of this grill and of BMW design in general. Um, and so after um, kind of dogging on BMW a little bit, let's let's switch gears and be a little positive and talk about our favorite BMW designs of all time. So Jeff, let's start with you. What um, going back through uh, BMWs of uh, the past, which is your favorite in terms of design? Yeah, there are a lot of great BMWs, especially the old school ones, uh, the CSL, the you know those 2002. They're all mm-hmm. really good, um, but I kind of have a weird thing for the E63 6 Series, which was 2003 to 2010, and that is the iconic bangle butt 6 Series. Wow. Yeah. Now, I, I have to say, I think it is a weird choice because I do not think that uh, if you polled 100 people that probably 99 of them would choose this car. Uh, what do you What do you like about it? You know, it's different. There's something just so interesting about this car because a lot of the old BMWs all kind of look the same, right? Generally, they have that That's boxy true. shape. Yeah. They have the tiny little kidneys. Um, but when Bangle and Van Hoydunk were doing this design it's just it's just such a radical departure from anything they've ever done and this whole i mean all these bmws of this era the five series the three series they all kind of look strange but i think the six works so well especially when you look at the m6 with the big wheels you know the bigger grill and all that stuff it's just such a good looking car to me and yes i agree that 99 percent of people probably won't agree with me but i don't know it's it's always worked for me this design well, th- that whole generation of the Bangle design and, and kind of, uh, I mean, it really it really kind of stuck in the brand after he stepped down as lead designer. And and I mean, it shook everything up. You're right. Uh, BMWs before then did look the same. I would argue they looked really good. But at some point, you, you, you evolve that kind of classic design so much that where are you going to go? And I give them credit for going a different direction because I think Audi did the exact opposite. I think Audi has now rehashed and evolved the same simple classic Audi design so much 
that I'm I'm bored with it and I just don't see anything interesting in it anymore. Where at least BMW kind of wiped the slate clean, started with something fresh. And even if they retreated from that afterwards, it, like I said, it wiped the slate clean and, and let them start with something new and, and go in a different direction. So I, I'll, I'll give them props to that. It's yeah. not my favorite, but I, I do respect it. And it's funny because even the even the six series after that, or after this one, the Bengal one, it kind of carried over a lot of those same lines and I think that looked really great too like it was more modern but it was still kind of the same shape and general you know architecture of of the E63 yeah kind of just get lets them stretch their legs a little bit try something different and I think future designs are better for it uh what about you Chris what is your favorite BMW design so I am going with the models directly before you really start seeing the bangle inspired influence, the mm. flame surfacing and the ba- bangle butt and all that stuff. So I am going with the E39 BMW 5 series. So that's from 1995 to 2004. Um, I mean, that's uh, icon. That's it's not just iconic. It is so timeless that, that I think that's the best way to put it is that it is t- it's it's simple, but it works. Um, and it's funny if you look at our picture one that how small the kidney grills are compared yeah. to what they are now. It's almost comical, but it's, it's just a I very bet, clean. I bet one hundred percent of the E thirty nines grill lets air through, and I bet it lets just as much air through as like the BMW Concept Four, which yeah. had probably equal sized cutouts in its giant grill. And it, it's just a simple, clean design. I ha- a guy in my neighborhood has a 525i from this generation, and I drive past it whenever I'm leaving the house. And it, I always look at it. It's gorgeous. It's just, and it's the, you know the 525. That's the base model. It's silver. It's not an M5 or anything like that. And it, the shape works just as well on that as it does on the yeah, range topping M5. You're right. The, and, the the base looks as premium as the as the range topping ones and the 540i and. And I would be completely remiss. Um, so, I my the second car I ever owned, the first one, the transmission died. We won't get into that. Second car I ever owned was an E30 BMW 325. Um, so that making it the very base model, um, it had the 325e engine for anyone who gets yeah, to that. Yeah, I mean that's. Um, and that's the BMW of like my youth. That's like one of the, the the designs I associate most with the brand. Yeah, and it's super boxy. Mine was not a show car by any means, but it got me through two years of high school and two years of college. And I still really love that car. I have a lot of great memories in it. So I remember too uh, in my young days, uh, Kelly Taylor on nine hundred two one zero drove one of those. It was a red convertible, um, and and it got <laughs> it became iconic in my pop culture lexicon from that. Uh, but that's how that's how those things work. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna pick something from a similar era. I'm gonna pick the. E38 BMW 7 Series. Um, And to remind everyone about this generation of the 7 Series, it's the one uh, Jason Statham drove in the first Transporter movie. Um, This, to me, is right before your your E39 5 Series, where it was still kind of the the more boxy BMW shape. Yeah, I'm looking at it now. Year it came out the year before, '94 as opposed to '95. So. And and it, I, I, to me, I think it was the the pinnacle of that that really classic era of BMW design. It was it's about as handsome and and well proportioned uh, as a vehicle as a vehicle can be. Straight lines. Uh, it just looks so. It's and and I would argue uh, just as timeless as the five series that you picked. I could buy one today and feel like a million bucks in it driving around. Um, also had a lot of tons of great engines. Uh, everything from inline sixes to V eight to V twelves. Um, just an an exceptional um, an exceptional design that I think. If I could be honest, I don't think a 7 Series has been as good looking as this one since, uh, including the new one with the giant grill. Um, Yeah, I just love this one. Um, All right. Well, speaking of grills, that kind of um, had me thinking before we started the podcast of, you know, there's there's lots of, I think, brands that... um, have grills that don't mean anything. They're just air openings. You know, it's just they have them because cars have to let air in and 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 that's it. And they'll play with the shape and one generation the grill will be shaped one way and the next generation will get changed. 
But then there are other brands, other brands like BMW that have an iconic grill. And for better or worse, it's a, a design or a constraint that they're never going to get away from. Um, and so that made me made me wonder, you know, besides BMW, what are some other iconic grills that we like from history? Uh, let me go first on this one, because um, I'm going to actually pick one that's very close to BMW's, and it's the Pontiac grill. Now, Pontiac has been famous for having its own twin grill. I don't know if you'd call it a kidney grill so much um, or if you'd pick another. It kind of organ. evolved into a kidney grill at one point and then kind so, of evolved away from it. And if you look in the 60s, it was actually when the, the dual grill started. Right. And yeah. and it was kind of cool because the grills like the headlights were on the very outside edges. And then it from there, it went all grill all the way to the center. And in the center, the grill stopped and it was sheet metal where the arrowhead badge was. And it was really cool back then, like very cool. Over over the years, that kind of really large grill got condensed into these two um, side-by-side grills that were always in the center that were very BMW-like. Um, but I've always loved them. Now they were, they were Pontiac was much more free to like I, uh, play with that design. And uh, Pontiac didn't include the grill on every single Pontiac ever made since then. Like sometimes it appeared, but you know, sometimes they bad engineered cars from other GM brands and there just wasn't room for the kidney grill or for the, for the dual grill. You know, the Fiero didn't have it. Uh, you know, its engine was in the back and, and uh, some other Pontiacs didn't have it. But by and large, I think if most people, even non car people, saw a Pontiac, they could recognize it by that grill. Now, my my favorite instance of it is uh, the Pontiac Grand Prix from the mid-90s. Um, that was a sharp-looking car at the time. And in particular, they made some quote-unquote high-performance versions. Specifically, they had a really rare one uh, from um, ASC McLaren that had a really great body kit. And the the twin grill on this one wasn't between um, the headlights. It was set lower into the front bumper, and it was kind of stretched really wide and thin. Um, and just a really cool interpretation uh, of that grill. Um, and yeah, I will forever associate Pontiac with, uh, you know, dual grills like this. Um, and, you know, pour one out for Pontiac. Always hated to see them go. But um, Chris, what about you? What's what's a grill uh, that, that you like a lot? So I'm going to go with Alfa Romeo's shield grill um, and looking around kind of it kind of started in the 30s although it was a much more kind of rounded version of what we see but by the 50s you very much got that kind of triangular flat at the top and then coming down to kind of a curved point at the bottom that literally or i mean practically any alfa romeo you look at is going to have that grill sometimes it'll have two outlets off to the side on the bottom right, sometimes right. it won't but the general shield shape is always there and it's just it makes an Alfa Romeo immediately recognizable. Um, and I mean, even if you look at their current thing, the Julia, the Stelvio, even the 4C, they all have that. And it's just pretty to me. It is. I, I, I agree. Um, that shield grill. Isn't it also mirror? Isn't there a badge on the front fender, too? That's a shield with a shamrock in it. Uh, well, that, the Quadrifolio, those are for always for like the top trim right, right. performance versions. But yeah. Um, yeah, perfectly identifiable. identifiable. And, you know, it, it's funny because I'm looking at uh, a picture of an Alfa Romeo uh, Stelvio right now. Um, or no, a Julia right now. And, and it brings up a topic that I kind of want to have a whole podcast episode about one day, which is with a grill like, like Alfa Romeo's that goes all the way down the front end. There's no front bumper. And that has, I have often thought, what happened to the front bumper? It just does not exist anymore. Like cars just completely ignore having any part of its front end that could absorb an impact. Like if you, if you tap your front end on something, it's going to break something very expensive. Uh, whereas if you go back, you know, 50 years you know, to the giant chrome bumpers uh, of those eras, you know, that the bumper was its whole, a whole styling element all its own. And now they've just disappeared. And w especially with these giant grills, you, like I said, 
you know, when when sixty percent of the front end is grill, if you tap the car in front of you, you just cracked a grill, and there's you know fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars to repair this giant plastic piece that doesn't do anything. <laughs> that was quite a soapbox. Bravo. Thank you. Like I said, I'll save it for a separate podcast episode. Uh, Jeff, what about you? What grill um, sticks out in your mind? I'm kind of in the same camp that I think a grill needs to like stand out and define a brand. And I would say that no grill has done better than the Rolls Royce grill because you look at a Rolls Royce and it is a Rolls Royce. You will never mistake it with anything else. And that grill has a big has a lot to do with it because how just daunting and in your face it is. Uh, I will say I don't think it looks great. Uh, <laughs> sort of like Lexus. So I almost went Lexus with this, which would have been an odd choice because the spindle grill has been a really a sore spot for a lot of people. Um, but the Rolls Royce grill, while it is really big and tacky, it is perfect. I mean, the, if you look at the Cullinan even, which has also gotten a lot of criticism. Uh, that grill just stands out and the whole car sort of wraps around it and if you look at like the older grills this thing that the design really hasn't changed in a decade be, or no, a century I, 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 yeah a century I think it goes yeah. back almost farther than any other iconic grill where you just keep going back in time and you see this monolithic kind of rectangular tall grill on Rolls Royces just, you know, like you said, decades, almost back to a century and it hasn't changed. I mean, that's, that's stain power. That is the definition of iconic. Okay. Well, we would love to hear what everyone uh, else thinks about uh, the BMW grill, specifically the one on the concept for, since that's the one we can't stop talking about. The conversation will continue on Facebook and Twitter where you can find us at MotorOne.com. And of course, on our website, MotorOne.com, where you can find us all in the comments as well. Moving on, I want to, we had a lot of response from last week's episode uh, about the Porsche Taycan versus uh, the Teslas, specifically the Tesla Model S. So we got a couple comments that I wanted to throw out there uh, and talk about a bit. So we got a comment from Nate regarding the 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 Taycan's identity. Uh, by the way, I'm going to say Taycan like five different ways because I still have not got it down. Nate says, what is it trying to be better at? A long distance touring car or a fun track car? For the track, it weighs in too heavy. For long distance travel, it's it's too bad they have not struck a deal with Tesla to use the US superchargers as CCS is lacking here. It looks great on the exterior though. Um, so uh, Nate, I would actually disagree a little bit because I think they they definitely know what they want it to be, and they want it to be a fun track car. They want it to be a performance car. They did not make a long distance touring car, and while it is extremely heavy, over five thousand pounds, and actually heavier than the than the Model S, which is larger than it, um, from what we've heard, uh, specifically from managing editor Brandon Turkis, who got to ride shotgun in one, they have the weight well under control, um, which. Uh, I find easy to believe in this era uh, and with Porsche's expertise that that you can't manhandle 5,000 pounds, especially when it's that low to the ground um, and you've got, you know, adaptive suspensions that are active and all of that stuff. So um, I would say they did pick an identity. It's a fun drag car and all signs point to them having succeeded. Um, the next comment, uh, came from Alan and he is much more in favor of the Taycan. He said, not much to debate. The Porsche is a much better car overall. The lower price model, when it becomes available, will put the nail in the coffin of the S, which is near dead already. Um, and this is, this is something that we talked about last week. I don't know if you guys, uh, heard Brandon and I arguing about it, which is the question of, you know, they've, they've come out with the Taycan Turbo and Taycan Turbo S and their ranges are at most going to be like 250 miles, uh, for, uh, the Turbo and probably less for the Turbo S. Um, our, our question that we were arguing is when they come out with the less expensive models, are they going to have more or less range? And Brandon was arguing that the base models will have much more range, will have more like uh, Model S range above 300 miles. And I was actually arguing the opposite, that the base models would have either the same or or lower range uh, because you're paying less. And I don't know, I guess when I look at Tesla pricing, like the more you pay, the more range you get. Even even the performance models only have a very slight range penalty um, compared to the long range models. But, you know... 
So I don't know. Do you guys have an impression from Porsche which you think, which way you think the base models will go? Do you think they're going to go the the long range version, or that if you pay less, that you're going to get less range? So I agree with you, John. I mean, just looking at the market, the battery is a very, very expensive part of EVs. It's where a lot of the tech is going. It's it's just an expensive piece of technology. And on a less expensive model, I think that's where they're going to save the cost. Out. Exactly. Right. They're going to use a smaller battery right. to cut the cost down to something more like $100,000. That's around the Model S. Um, and I, they wouldn't they wouldn't do what Tesla sometimes does, which is use the same battery, but software, but but software limit the range because you're still charging for the battery. I mean, you're still using the giant expensive battery and you got to charge somebody for that. So I don't know, Jeff, what, what do you think? Yeah, we already know that that they're going to do a smaller battery pack and and come in at under one hundred thousand dollars, supposedly uh, in the take in. So. I think it'll drop the range. I think it'll drop the performance. I think it'll. I think the Taycan will still be generally more expensive than the Model S. Even like the lower range model will probably still be a bit more expensive than like, I don't know, the mid range Model S. Right. Um, but to the earlier comment, yeah, Porsche's for sure doing this. This is a performance car, whereas the Tesla's, you know, does great in a straight line and it's really comfortable. But I think the Taycan is more for the track. Yeah, and maybe, maybe who knows? Maybe they'll come out with a long range version that has the the largest battery pack, uh, and then has other optimizations for range, uh, whether they be aerodynamic or weight or whatever. I mean, maybe they will go for three hundred miles of of range that way and sell it probably less than the turbos, but more than the base models, like maybe one twenty five to one fifty. I can see. I, I think that would be smart. I have no uh, idea if they'll do that. We haven't heard anything. Um, so, um, that kind of leads us to the, to the other development on this war. Uh, I think it's fair to call between Tesla and Porsche that has, um, arisen this past week, which is Elon Musk announced that, uh, he would be taking the model S to the Nürburgring to try and set its own lap time, uh, and beat the, the Porsche Taycan's time. Now the Porsche Taycan's time was a record for, was it a record for four door cars? Four door EV production car. Okay, it's a four. So it's a pretty narrow uh, field anyway. Uh, but uh, they set it. They actually set it with a pre production car, um, and I think they had like one or two modifications for safety. Um, yeah, they usually put a cage in them, stuff like right. that. Right. But so does at least. In the past week, um, no one knew if if Musk was serious because they hadn't booked any track time. Then it came to light that maybe they have some track time booked for next week. Uh, then we started seeing uh, a Tesla Model S uh, show up at the ring that appeared to have some modifications, uh, wider, some pretty significant modifications. Yeah, I mean, it had wider fenders, so f- to accommodate larger wheels, it was wearing. Um, Pilots, uh, what are those pilot cup tires? Michelin, yeah, Michelin, yeah, yeah, Michelin tires. Uh, and then they also saw some Goodyear Eagle F ones too. Um, so they might be trying different ones. It, ha- it had a, um, it almost looked like a makeshift rear spoiler. It was not not uh, very final. It looked like, and it actually had. Uh, speaking of grills, a uh, grill it had an opening in the front, which kind of the Model S and Teslas are famous for not having grills at all, but it needed extra cooling probably for braking and things like that. Oh, it also had carbon ceramic brakes, uh, which would be a first for Tesla. And of course, Tesla's tight-lipped. They haven't said anything about this car or um, or why it has these modifications or anything like that. Um, however, the speculation is that in order to make it quote-unquote production, they will sell these modifications as part of like a Nürburgring package that you can add to your Model S, um, which is kind of like, you know, I'm a, I'm a Tesla fanboy, but that's like a, a cheat within the rules kind of thing. Um, you know, they're clearly just going after beating Porsche. That's what they want. Uh, but man, this has created uh, a, a lot of fervor online. Um, you know, with people picking which camp uh, <laughs> they're can, they're rooting for. Can I offer my opinion, like on this? It just, I don't get it. Like the to me, the Tesla and the Taycan are two different vehicles aimed at kind of different buyers. 
in a certain way. The Tesla, like uh, like Jeff was just saying, it's a very comfortable cruiser. It is incredibly, it's a quick car, but it it's packed with tech. It's got autopilot, you, you know, driver assist. It's a great highway car. And the Taycan is, is tuned more to be a driver's car. You know, I agree, disagree whether it's a track car or not, but it's certainly a performance right. vehicle that you're supposed to kind of go, you know, canyon carving or take on fun roads, that type of thing. I almost don't know why Porsche made the Taycan four doors. Like, it's a performance car, like, and quite small on the inside. It's not a large car inside, although it's got dimensions that are similar to the Model S on the outside. But I mean, look, I, I largely agree with you, Chris. Like, uh, first of all, I, I think Nurburgring lap times are for entertainment purposes only. They have no practical value whatsoever. So I don't begrudge Porsche for, you know, running their car and going through those steps. They always do that. Um, with Tesla, I certainly think they did not need to um, challenge Porsche in this way. Um, I get the impression, I've heard other people say this, that Musk is a lot like uh, our president, uh, President Trump, where he just says something and no one on his team is prepared for it. And then they have to go figure out how to do it. And that's kind of, I get the impression that's what happened here, where Musk was just like, we're going to the Nürburgring next week. And then he turned to, you know, 10 people who are sweating bullets uh, off stage and said, okay, make it happen. And now this team has to go find some way to make it happen and beat Porsche on the ring. Uh, but to, you know, to what end, if they, if they do it, obviously people are, you know, people who aren't fans of Tesla are just going to say they cheated. And, and so it's not really going to solve anything. Yeah. And I mostly agree with that, that to on a larger scale, like who cares about Nürburgring lap times? It doesn't matter in the Taycan. It doesn't matter in the Model S. It doesn't matter in anything like very few people who buy those cars are going to care and or ever go to the Nürburgring to drive their cars. Like it's, it's all just kind of silly, I think. Yeah, it's marketing. It's marketing. Uh, you know, I, I, I appreciate automakers taking their cars there to do development testing um, because I think it is one of the you know best tracks in the world with varied elevations and so many turns. And like you, you really have to have a robust car to survive that. Um, so it'll be interesting. I mean, I think, I think if anything, I'm interested to see the Tesla go through this experience to see if its cooling system can handle it, um, or, you know, and to see if it exposes anything, um, from it. So we'll see. It's supposed to be next week. No one knows what, exactly what day or what time. Um, was and- the Nico Rosberg being the driver, was that a joke? from musk is that a confirmed thing no it's not i mean nothing's confirmed because the only information we're getting is from musk's tweets so nico rosberg did uh offer to drive and uh musk seemed to accept on twitter uh but uh i don't believe nico has been seen at the nurburgring in fact he was seen at the frankfurt motor show um so he if if he is driving he's not there doing any of the testing right now um so we'll see we'll see i heard there was another guy too that somebody had mentioned uh had offered um and he even said that he was heading to the nurburgring i forget who it was but um yeah who the driver is will be well that'll be as important as anything because oh yeah driving fast on the nurburgring a track with that 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 long with that many turns you need somebody who has memorized the entire track um and so you really you know who it who it is and what their experience is will be super important All right. So coming up, we're going to find out what we've all been driving this week. Uh, Before the break, though, a reminder that if you're listening to this online, you can also get our show on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. So please uh, subscribe and make sure you get the episode every week when we release it. Welcome back. Uh, During this part of the show, we talk about what cars we've been driving this week. And today, uh, let's start with you, Jeff. What have you driven in the past week? Uh, Last week, I was in Dallas driving the Toyota Camry and Avalon TRD models. Wow. This is... That was interesting. Just the the existence of these cars uh, confuses me. So, So tell us, what were they like? Yeah. Well, their existence, I kind of appreciate, right? Because... You know, I say Camry TRD and everyone kind of scoffs like, you know, Camry with a body kit, right? But it's a little more than that. And so is the Avalon. Uh, They like totally retuned the suspension. So it's a lot stiffer. It handles a lot better. 
um, and it just feels like a genuine sporty sedan, right? Both mm-hmm. of them. Um, the only thing I didn't like, well, I do like the V6 in in both of these cars, right? So 301 horsepower, power doesn't get an increase is the only problem. I so, mean, is that really a problem though? These were I, 300 horsepower uh, in a midsize sedan is is a lot. Yeah, like, in the Camry, it's not a problem, right? Yeah. For for even though the Camry is actually like. It doesn't weigh that much less than the Avalon. It feels a lot quicker. I think just they put power down a lot better in the Camry than they do the Avalon. Um, and I think that's sort of based on their segment, right? Because the Avalon's a big cruiser and the Camry's a little smaller, nimbler. Um, but in the Avalon, man, that feels like it, it needs like 50 more horses or something. Yeah. Or it needs better throttle. Or it needs well, a look at some other... Some other large cars, uh, large performance cars. Like I think about the the Ford Taurus SHO, sadly canceled now. But mm-hmm. you know that had a three hundred and sixty five horsepower twin yeah. turbo V six. Like yeah. that was a fun time. That was more than enough engine for that car, uh, which was just like the Avalon, kind of big and heavy in a cruiser. Yeah, and it, these these cars. I mean, the Avalon especially just didn't put power down really well compared to like the Taurus show or whatever. Uh, but the Camry was really good. I, I was actually really surprised by that car. Um, it's thirty, what thirty one thousand, and if you're if you're shopping wow. in that segment for thirty one thousand dollar sporty sedan, I mean, first of all, you can't get anything else with a V six, right? That isn't a luxury car. So the Camry already has that notch in its belt. If you're really one of those people that doesn't uh, want a four cylinder, which I don't know why you wouldn't, uh, but for thirty one grand, I think the only other car that is as good or is as competitive like sporty wise is the WRX, which is you know, it's a definitely a notch above the Camry. It's definitely a in sporty terms performance. It's in terms of performance. smaller in terms of yeah. size. Right. But if you're if you're shopping in thirty one thousand dollars for that kind of performance, uh the Camry's a a good option, actually. And it's really comfortable on road. It's still a Camry. God, so. I'm trying to think, do we have any performance versions of mid-size sedans anymore i mean i again not to date myself but you know going back to my youth it was the ford taurus sho the dodge spirit rt uh didn't the lumina have one too the lumina ss or something like there there like that was always a like it was a given you'd have a performance model yeah. um of well, your the, mid-size I, sedan i would say the accord sport is probably the best direct competitor uh it's a little cheaper it's less powerful it's got a turbo four rather than a v6 uh, I think that one's a little more dynamic. I think that platform's a little better, but yeah. But I like I like I also and, and maybe uh, maybe disagree. But I like the the ex- the aesthetic upgrade that a true like sport model like a TRD gets. Like the, to me, the Accord Sport like hardly looks different than a regular Accord. Yeah, and the Camry looks good. So actually, fun fact: the wing on the back of the Camry or the spoiler um, was actually going to be much bigger than that. So they had to be. They had to tone it down. So wow. the the initial prototype that they used for the Camry TRD had a uh, Subaru BRZ TS wing on the back. And no if you, way! If you can imagine how big that wing is on the BRZ, oh, just please think ask of, them. Please ask them for a photo. I I asked him, and he said he can't show me that one of the engineers. Oh. I was like, oh god! But just imagine how ridiculous that wing would look on the back of a Camry. Oh my God, that would have been great. So did they discuss how that decision was made? Did some someone who wasn't an engineer walk in and look at it and be like, oh no, we are Yeah, I think that. that's pretty much what happened. I think the engineers <laughs> were like, oh yeah, this is awesome. All the downforce. And then some random person walked in. They're like, we cannot sell this. We cannot put there, a Camry on the road that looks like that. Were there engineers 17-year-old teenagers? <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm sure the marketing team came in was like, yeah, no, I can't put that on TV. Sorry. Uh, all right. Well, thanks for that, Jeff. Uh, what about you, Chris? What, what have you been driving this week? So uh, I guess I've been p- driving a Datsun 510. I can't quite tell. So um, if you've been looked at the site, uh, a video game from THQ Nordic, the developers Bugbear, who have been doing racing sims for years now, um, they supplied us with some codes for the game Wreckfest. And so me, uh, Chris Smith, who has been on this podcast before, and another one of our writers got together last Sunday and all played together. And it's a super fun little game. Like, uh, Jeff, you've been playing it too. You didn't play it. You have PS4. We were playing it on Xbox One, but uh, I know you've played it too. And it's fun. Like, 
uh, the multiplayer, at least the ver the mode we were playing in, there were no limits in terms of what class of car you could take. There's C, B, and A classes, and that just determines kind of speed. Um, and well, and to be clear, this is like demolition derby racing, right? Demolition and what the Europeans call banger racing, which is, you know, wrecked car. It's still like circle uh, road track rally cross racing where you're doing laps, but you're still banging into each other. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, so, yeah, there's de I should mention that there's demolition derby, there's banger racing, and then there's also figure eight racing. Oh, which, I love figure eight racing. Yeah. Oh, that's um, awesome. And so at least the mode, like I was saying, that we were playing in, there was no limit to what type of car you could bring in. And I really like the, the uh, tuned version of the base C type car. And there were races where I was beating both of them in faster cars because when you're just hitting other people, speed doesn't isn't the only factor like if someone slams into you and someone else drives by you that that's just kind of what happens so it, it it's not that it doesn't require skill it's just a very different skill set that you're not used to in like a forza horizon or gran turismo and yeah with all with what are the what are like the full gamut of cars so um, they are all cars that look real but don't have licenses which is why oh, okay. I said, I guess I'm driving a Datsun 510 because it says that it's Japanese and it's rear wheel drive and looking at it, I guess it's a Datsun 510, but there's like, there are also versions that of like a Volvo 240 wagon. That's what um, oh, that'd be one perfect. of our writers yeah. was using. And then there's like uh, a Camaro and like a Chevy Caprice. Um, there's a Saab 93 because Bugbear is from Europe, and I think they're from Sweden actually, which is why the Volvo and the Saab and stuff get in. Ford Escorts. Like if you look at them and squint, you can kind of tell. Oh, there's a Honda CRX, which a lot <laughs> of people use in racing on at least like the the track circuits because hey, it's man, really the quick. The smaller you are, the harder you are to hit. Yeah, and, and so it's just. It, it's a lot of fun. It's a very different experience from, you know, a Forza or something like that. But those you're not going to get a new Forza or Gran Turismo this year. So yeah. doing this how's is the, kind of a neat difference. How, how's the damage modeling and how that affects the driving? Um, so you kind of have options. You can have damage on, but to where it doesn't really affect the car or Got you it. can so have visual or yeah, just purely visual damage or you can do kind of realistic damage. What were you um, guys doing? Um, I know I was cosmetic. I don't know what the other two are doing. I, I, I'm not sure in the mode if we were all on the same or if you could choose or what, but you can bang the cars up. Um, I, I like to be in like the in cockpit view and I had the front end completely ripped off and you could see the <laughs> engine. Um, oh, wow. That's cool. All of the, the track side stuff is dynamic. It doesn't just sit there. So I've had several cases where you're driving and someone kind of nudges you into the tires and the tire ends up sitting on your hood for a few seconds, maybe at least until you turn or brake or do something because uh, that's cool. It's just there. So, yeah, it, it's, I mean. Uh, can you ever be taken out of commission like your engine catches fire or something like that? So in the regular races, I think you can set it up that way. Again, in the multiplayer mode we were playing, there was a respawn system. So ah. if you did get completely taken out, you could respawn. But you were generally by that point, everyone had passed you. So you're kind of at the back of the pack. But then they someone else could easily get knocked out and then they would be behind you. Or yeah, oh I've been doing career mode a lot. And especially on career mode, you I, I keep it on just normal damage. Um, and you can get knocked out pretty easily. The worst, literally the, the thing I hate, <laughs> and I get, I love this game, but I get frustrated because my tire always falls off. So I'm oh, always- really? I haven't had that at all. I'm Maybe always I, driving I around damage. on three wheels and I can barely like crawl and then I have to restart. That's the only thing that like annoys me to no end, but then it just forces me to go back and start over. And I was up last night till like midnight playing this game. Oh my God, I've got to install this game. Yeah, so I, it's funny that you mentioned that. I haven't had any tires fall off, but I did see the tip that if you get two neat wheels knocked off, then you're out yeah, of commission and done. you have to re respawn or restart or whatever. But yeah, I hadn't had that happen yet. So interesting. Uh, this sounds awesome. There was, um, what's the other, uh, there was a non Forza, non Gran Turismo racing game that had a demolition derby race mode. I'm trying to remember what it I is. Know. It was a good game. Uh, it made a. Was it like a, one of the dirt games or something like that? No, maybe? it was by one of those companies that also made a rally rally game too. Mm. 
it doesn't matter. I, I point being, uh, I very much love um, like demolition derby races in in racing games. Uh, it's just like you said, it's a different skill than racing fast in a Forza or a Gran Turismo, and just inherently more fun to cause mayhem and damage. Um, well, that's fun. I, I again, I'm gonna. And I have to get mine, uh, my, fire my Xbox up because it's been dormant for a while. Yeah, you should play with us. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, so this past week, um, I had another Mercedes. Uh, last week, the week before, I had the Mercedes AMG GT53 four door, which was epic. It was awesome. Uh, one of my favorite car designs uh, today. Um, and this week it was replaced by a Mercedes-Benz C300 coupe, um, which is certainly, you know, toned down on the, on the excitement dial. Uh, but I still really like it a lot. I, Mercedes exterior design right now is uh, to me on point. It is, they are just, they've come up with a design language that seems to look really good uh, no matter what, uh, shape or size it's applied to. And I particularly like um, the, the C-Class coupe, uh, especially like the, the rear end and the rear pillars, like it's just a perfect roundness uh, for a coupe. Um, and actually the, the one thing I didn't like about the, uh, GT 53 four door was its interior. It's got a lot of extra buttons, uh, that do a lot of the same thing. So there's a lot of redundancy and complications. And the nice thing about the C300 is you get in and it's like, the, the interior design is way simpler and easier to use. And I think that also makes it look better too. Like you can see the real wood and all of that a lot more. Um, so well, yeah, it feels like just a proper, proper luxury coupe. Speaking of grills, John, what do you think about uh, Mercedes? Cause I haven't been a fan of their recent grills, especially the, uh, the Pan Americana ones. Well, I mean, do you not like them because of their size? I just or? think they're bland. I don't think there's anything special about them. I, I, I think that's a fair point. I would argue, though, that on the uh, Mercedes AMG GT Coupe and the four-door, what I like about them is their their front ends are like, like, almost like somebody's taken a Mercedes and blown some extra air into it and puffed out the front end. And it's got this kind of like nice um, curve around the, the front end of the grill that I really like. Um, but I, I, it's a fair point. They're not... Um, incredibly innovative with their grill design right now but could that be a really good strategy and that's kind of like letting your competitors hang themselves with their own rope while you just sit by and not make an ugly grill like that's all you have to do is not make an ugly one maybe you're not going to make a beautiful one but just don't <laughs> avoid the mistakes that all of your competitors are making how's um outward visibility because that that yeah. pillar is pretty steep so i was curious blind spot wise and stuff does the tech kind of make that a moot point or is that an issue uh, it does a little. I, I yes, the the rearward, the the analog rearward visibility through the mirrors is not that great. Um, when I'm backing up, like out of my driveway, I've got a thin driveway going next to my house, um, and so I rely like 100 percent on the cameras uh, and the side mirrors, and that works great. Like I'm not, but I can't look over my shoulder and get a good view of yeah, where that, I am. Looking at it, that's kind of the impression that you get. Yeah, for sure. When I'm on the highway, yeah, I mean, yeah, same thing. You're not going to look over. You're going to rely on the blind spot monitoring system. And hopefully you, um, you know, adjusted your mirrors correctly and have good sight lines there. Uh, and that'll save you. But yeah, yeah, you're definitely there. There, There is a little, maybe just a little claustrophobic feeling, that, but not so much. I mean, it's not like you're sitting in a Camaro and you feel like you're looking out of the front of a tank. Um, it's still pretty good. And, and the technology has your back. So um, but yeah, I've, I've, um, you know, following up a, a great car, like the GT 53 four door, yeah, that's not a easy act to follow. Um, uh, but this, um, as wild as that one was, this one just seems like, man, this is, this is a car I could live with every day and be super happy. Um, this is definitely like the, the bread and butter of the Mercedes lineup. So, um, so yeah, it's been a good, good week in terms of that. Um, all right. Well, that brings us to the end of our show. Um, you can follow Jeff on Twitter at not a boat captain, uh, follow Chris Bruce at Chris Bruce, 1985 and me at John underscore M underscore Neff. Uh, I want to thank you two for being here on the podcast with me today. Yeah, yeah it's been a lot of fun. And of course, thank all of you out there for listening. We'll see you next week.